Mark chapter 9 this morning. Last time in this series, Seeking Jesus, we covered the subject of seeking Jesus when you have a quote-unquote unbreakable addiction. But today, similar, but a little different, seeking Jesus when you have a loved one with an unbreakable addiction. And remember, I have that word unbreakable in quotations because we're going to find out it isn't unbreakable. Maybe by the means and methods and schemes of man unbreakable, but not by the power of God. So, seeking Jesus when you have a loved one with an unbreakable addiction. And I will say this, that is what you need to do, is seek Jesus. I have seen this. One set of parents that I remember watching, I saw them and, and, and my heart broke because they were grieved over their son and the power that Satan had over him. And oh, they had money. And they threw all the money they could. And they would try this professional here, or send off to that thing over there, or whatever. And the father, who his whole life, I, I could just tell, he'd been able to fix everything in, with money. But he realized he was powerless to deal with his son. But he wasn't a Christian. And he didn't turn to the Lord. But today we're going to see a father who did do that. But remember that this word seek means to go in search or quest of, to look for, to search for by going from place to place. This week at Vacation Bible School we had a game one day where they were supposed to seek the cross. And uh, Jubilee had taken a little wooden cross and hidden it in the yard somewhere, and the kids had to go out and find the cross. And they looked here, and they looked there, and then eventually they started asking questions. Are we hot? Are we cold? Are we getting close? And she'd say, you're cold. And they'd run over this way. You're getting hotter. You know, they're getting closer. And eventually, and I went out there, and I started looking, and I couldn't find it. And this was the little kids, and I'm thinking, Jubilee, this is, this is a little too hard to find this cross. So then she looks at me, she says, you can't find it either. I said, I can't find it. She said, oh, great. <laughs> so I kept looking, and then eventually I found it. And I was going to kind of bring it out from where it was. But then Joanna came along, and she found it. <laughs> she found the cross, but she had to seek it. She had to look diligently and not give up. And that is what is necessary. We need to seek Jesus. That is with diligence until we find Him. Remember, He made a promise that if we seek Him, we will find Him. But there is a condition. We must seek Him with all our heart. There must be that wholehearted pursuit of God if you expect to find Him. A nonchalant, casual approach will never find God. But a diligent seeking will always find God. It is His solemn promise to us. Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. We're going to read this story, which is probably familiar to most of you, about a father who sought Jesus. It says in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, And when he came to his disciples, that is Jesus, he'd been up on the mount that we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And he comes down the mountain and he gets to where the other disciples were. Three of the disciples were up there with him. So there was another nine still waiting down at the bottom of the hill. He comes down this hill. There are the nine. And it says he saw a great multitude about them. And the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question you with him? And 
And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answereth him and saith, now look at this, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes, it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer. And fasting. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this, your holy word. Come now and bless the teaching and preaching of it to our hearts. Anoint my tongue. Help me to properly represent you. Give me clarity and simplicity and power. Let the power of God be released through the preaching of your holy word this morning. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first point this morning from this text is that this man's son had lost control of himself, was possessed and controlled by demons. This is very similar to last time. When we were looking at the man who lived among the tombs in the land of the Gadarenes, this, this boy was in a similar state. Lost control of himself because he's controlled by demons, or at least a demon. I told you last time, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, how does a person become possessed of a devil? Well, this boy had had it from his youth, since he was a kid. I, it makes me think, though I don't know, but the fact that he says, since his youth, seems to imply that he was no longer a youth. Now maybe he was 20 years old, or 22 or 23, but this has been an issue that the father had been dealing with in this son for many years, and it is, is drawn on now into his adulthood. 
How does a person become possessed with devils? I gave you a few things. One, drugs and alcohol will open the door. Because when you take drugs or alcohol, you, you, you cause your spirit to lose control of your body. And it's like you're saying, you know what, I'm not going to be in charge of me anymore. And it opens the door for a devil to come and say, okay, I'll be in charge of your body then. And he'll take over. Don't think drugs and alcohol are some harmless thing spiritually. Witch doctors and witches have used drugs and potions, that's a, just a drug, to, to open people up to get demonic power. This is nothing new. In the Bible it's called sorcery. The use of drugs or alcohol for a spiritual purpose. It's dangerous. It could be a drug you buy on the street or a drug you get from a doctor's prescription. Be careful. Make sure you're looking to God and God alone to meet all your spiritual needs. Number two, witchcraft, the occult. I, I wonder if this was the case with this boy. If his mom or dad or some family member had gotten involved in the occult and they had invited this into their home. Now the consequence of it. Some people think that messing with the occult is, is, uh, is harmless. It's child's play. I told you, don't invite it into your home via Harry Potter or anything else. Ouija boards or any of that stuff. Purge it from your house. Purge it from your families. Don't give place for the devil one inch. He'll take it. He can get influence and power over your children. I remember reading this story. It was a horrible story. Absolutely horrible. Someone had a pet python. And uh, the python got out. And it went through the neighborhood. And there was a home where there was little kids and they had the window propped open. And in the night, that python got through the window and strangled the baby. It was a true story. And I remember reading that, thinking, oh, can you imagine how those parents felt had they kept the window shut at least that night? And I just instantly thought, oh God, how many people are keeping the window window just cracked enough for the serpent, the devil to get in the home and destroy their children and they wake up later having found their child already dead, shut the windows to Satan, don't let him in the other one I told you is greed greed, the love of money is the root of all evil Judas had this love for money which caused him to betray Christ and it says Satan entered into him. Greed. And then flat out rebellion. Saul. God says wipe out the Amalekites and he partially obeys. Partial, obedi partial obedience is complete disobedience. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. And the prophet Samuel spoke to him and said, Rebellion is as the sin of what? Witchcraft. Witchcraft. It's on the same plane. It is the very heart of Satan himself who rebelled against Almighty God. When you rebel against God, you're basically getting in step with Satan. And don't be surprised if he gets a stronghold in your life. Rebellion. We need to be on guard against rebellion. Wives, don't be rebellious toward your husbands. Children, don't be rebellious toward your children. Men, don't be rebellious toward God. And all of us need not to be rebellious toward any authority. 
governmental or spiritual. It doesn't mean we always have to agree with our authority, but make sure a spirit of rebellion is not in you. There's a difference. There's a difference between standing up for what is right and having a spirit of rebellion. All the difference in the world. And if you have this spirit of rebellion, you can cloak it in spirituality. But you have turned your feet and begun to follow Satan and be careful. You might end up like the sons of Korah, falling headlong into a pit to hell. Now, I want to make a distinction this morning. You know, there are physical problems. How many of you have a physical problem this morning? Raise your hand. I don't mean you look funny. I mean you have a problem. The other night I was talking to Brother Scott about my knee. I tore the meniscus in this knee, and then this knee started hurting from the compensation, and then my legs... And now my feet with plantar fasciitis and I, I'm getting all messed up. We have physical problems. Some of you have bad backs. And some people get headaches. And some people have allergies. We all have these things. These are common to men. Here, I've heard of people talking about this. Oh, I got my bad back. It's the cross I have to bear. Well, that's not the cross you have to bear, okay? <laughs> Because wicked people have bad backs, too. <laughs> Crosses, that, that's, that's the suffering you go through because you're being obedient to the Lord. Amen. But having physical problems comes to everybody. It comes to the wicked as well as the righteous. Remember, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach and your many infirmities. Timothy was plagued with physical problems. The Apostle Paul had physical problems. Physical problems touch all of us. But then there's another thing. There's spiritual problems. There is sin. Sin in all of its forms. We have to be very careful to make a, a distinction between spiritual problems and physical problems. Do you know what the devil wants everybody to believe? The devil wants everybody to think they're good spiritually. All their problems are physical. Drunkenness. Well, you just have a, a, a problem with your brain that causes you to drink. It's not a spiritual thing. Listen. Listen. God will not cast anyone into hell because they have a broken arm. But he says he'll cast drunkards into the lake of fire. That's a spiritual thing. All right? Other people will say, well, I have, I have, I have depression and anxiety. It's physical. It's a physical chemical imbalance. Beware. I was just reading this week a scientist, a leading scientist in Europe, who had who put out, maybe some of you saw this article, he had put out images that he had gotten of some, you know, with his telescope of a moon, a mm -hmm. uh, Mars moon or whatever, and he just confessed. Listen, he had taken a picture of baloney. Chorizo. Oh, chorizo, yeah, yeah that's yeah, what it was. Yeah. Chorizo. Yeah. And made, and, and made it round, but it had all these little things in it, you know, it looked, it looked like, like a star. It looked like a star, but he yeah. came out, I actually had took a picture of cheese and submitted it as a thing. Why do I bring that up? Be careful of what scientists may say. I'm not saying we discount everything. I, we got to be careful of getting too conspiratorial about everything. But listen, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious. Anxiety is a spiritual problem. What does the world say the answer for anxiety is? Take a pill. They get you to do drugs. 
and it only makes the problem worse. The Bible says the answer for anxiety is prayer. It's a spiritual thing. There are physical problems which touch everyone. There are spiritual problems which can only be dealt with properly by going to the Lord. But now listen. There are some physical and spiritual problems which go together. There are some. And we have to be careful to be able to distinguish. Just because someone has a physical problem doesn't mean it's spiritual. Somebody's got a headache and they say, oh, the demon's attacking me. No, it's not a demon. Necessarily. But there is demonic activity and demonic possession that does have a physical manifestation. Look here. This is called a deaf and dumb spirit. So this boy is deaf. He couldn't hear and he couldn't speak. And Jesus said that physical affliction is because of the possession. The spiritual problem had physical effects. There are plenty of spiritual problems that have physical effects. And we would be wrong to just try to deal with the physical. We need to get to the root, which is the spiritual. This boy who couldn't speak and couldn't hear, had this because of a demon. Now, I want us to be very careful here. Some people have wrongly taken this. If anybody has a physical affliction, it must be a demon. And they're trying to cast out demons out of mentally handicapped people or this or that. Be careful that you don't go overboard and begin to misdiagnose there's a need for great spiritual discernment. And of course Jesus knows. He knows why this boy can't hear and can't speak. And it wasn't just that he couldn't hear and couldn't speak. There was other fruit of it. He was out of control. He was out of control. The father said at times he, he cast himself into the water, cast himself into the fire. Things that a rational person would not do. This is even things beyond a rational. The human body wouldn't do it. Let me tell you something. If your hand gets close to fire, what happens? It just naturally comes back. One time I was filling a truck full of tree branches that I had cut and loaded it up and I like a dummy threw a, 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 a thing over the top to this ratchet strap brother Bill I reached down under that truck to hook find somewhere to hook it without looking and guess where I put my arm awesome. right across that tailpipe and the truck was running and as I did that I didn't even think about it my, my arm just swings back and then my elbow, my funny bone, hit something else. And I was like, oh, oh. and my, my, this arm is in my burn, I'm burning, and I burnt myself really good. But you just, you don't even have to think about it. God's built our, our bodies to stay away from that which harms us. And this boy is jumping into fires, jumping into water. Oh, he's not in control of himself. He's out of control where Satan has gotten control of his life. Now let me tell you this. I mentioned it last time, but I want to emphasize it more today. Satan and his servants do not love you. They do not care about your well-being. This has struck me a lot recently. I look at people who dedicate their life in the service of Satan. I mean, they will give their all to promote the devil's work. 
the devil doesn't love them one bit. He doesn't say, oh, wow, look at that loyal servant. I'm going to be loyal to them. He could care less, or he couldn't care less, rather. He just use them as long as he can until he can't use them anymore and then just destroy them. God's not like that. God loves us. Satan hates you. Maybe you've heard stories or seen depictions of this gang life where, oh, the camaraderie, right? Oh, join it. Wait, you're, the, you're part of it. Until the minute you cross them and then done with you. What love is that? That's not love. That's using. Satan will use you. John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's his purpose. Jesus called him the destroyer. Think about the names for Satan. He's called the liar or the father of lies. He's called the thief. He's called the destroyer. He's called the deceiver. But the destroyer, he just wants to destroy. He'll destroy any and all that he can. Uh, have you ever wondered why? Why does Satan work so hard? Does he think he's going to win? I don't think he does. I mean... At least the demons knew they weren't going to win. They said, don't cast us into the deep before the time. Because they know they're going to, the time's coming. I suppose Satan could be so demented that he, he doesn't, he thinks there's a chance he could win. But I don't even think that. I think he likes someone that says, if I'm going down, I'll take as many down with me. And maybe in a spiteful way against God himself. For he knows that God loves us. And how, how, how could he hurt God even more, a little more, by just leading in rebellion and destruction some more of the creatures that God loves. <clears throat> Satan is just wicked. There's nothing good about him. And this, this boy had just been so ravaged by Satan attempting to destroy him on multiple cases. Can you imagine being this father? Just always worried. Always having to keep his eye on his son because he might f jump into the lake and drown. Or might jump into the fire. Or might run out in front of a car. Always having to keep track of him. I come to the next point, the sermon. This father was desperate and humble. He was desperate and he was humble. He came to Jesus wanting help. He says, if you can help us, I love this, Mark chapter 9, verse 21 and 22. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes they had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Help us, Lord. Help us. We need help. And have compassion. You know what compassion is? It is to look on someone with pity... And come to their aid. Where could this father turn? Now, why did he turn to Jesus in his desperation? Why? I wonder if he liked that woman that had the issue of blood who tried doctors and all that and she tried and tried... 
could have been this father had tried everything. But now he gets word about this guy, Jesus of Nazareth. And maybe he heard the story of the man among the Gadarenes. You know what? Maybe that man among the Gadarenes had actually traveled back to his home. Remember it says he began to tell his story to everybody about what great things God had done for him. Maybe this father heard that story and he thought, maybe this guy Jesus can help me. Help us. Help my son. The testimony of one can stir up faith in another. And so he comes to Jesus... Desperate for help, but humble. You know, you've got to be humble to admit that you need help, first of all. But you've got to be humble also to ask for help in the right way. Think about it this way. You could come to God and say, God, you let my son get this way. Now you better help us. God, why did you let a demon possess my son? That's your fault. Now you better fix what you messed up. Help us, right? You could come in that way. In pride. Yes, asking for help. But with an entitlement and an arrogancy about you. As if you deserve better from God. Listen. The only thing you and I deserve from God is death in hell. That's what we deserve Anything of his goodness is him just being compassionate to us. So listen, this father doesn't come and say, I demand you help my son. He's saying, have compassion. Have pity on us. Notice this. Help us. Help my son. And all I love this one. Help me. Now you say, where did he say, help me? Well, Jesus says to him, if you have faith to believe, all things are possible. And this father was such a, I mean, it says he cries. He's, he's tearful. Tears are falling down his eyes. And he says, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He didn't have a physical problem. He didn't have the spirit, same spiritual problem as his son, which was possession. But he had a spiritual problem. He needed God to help him have more faith. He had some. But he wanted more. And he was humble enough to admit it. I know he had some faith. I mean, when he says, I believe, there was belief. Or why would he show up there? The only reason he'd come to that place to find Jesus is because he believed, at least to some degree, that Jesus could and may help him. He had some faith. But there was in him some doubt. Maybe. He thought, well, he probably can, but maybe he can't help. Or... He probably will, because I've heard he's good, but maybe he won't to me. Maybe some guilt of his past. Maybe this father, as I had alluded to, had been involved in the occult and opened the door. And now he's feeling and he said, well, it's kind of my fault. I, I look to God, but you know what? Maybe I'm just going to have to suffer through the consequences of my own sin. There was a portion of him which believed but there was a portion of him which doubted. But what he says is this, Lord, help me in that area that I doubt. I need your help. He doesn't say, well, I doubt and I'm just going to be honest. You know, I'm just going to be real. I hear so much talk like that. I'm just going to be real. I just doubt God. That's arrogant. That's not real. That's real arrogance. God wants us to be genuine. But the right heart should be this. I admit, I have doubts, but I want God to help me not to have them. 
That's different than glorying in your shame. Yes, this man was real. He was genuine. He admitted his shortcoming. But as he's asking that God would help him not come short in that. It's all the difference in the world. When I hear people boldly proclaim their shortcomings and just say, well, I'm just being real, that means you're comfortable with it. This man wasn't comfortable with it. He didn't want to have the doubt. So he asked the Lord for help. Maybe that's you. Maybe you, like this father, have someone you love. You know they're just bondage to sin and Satan. You want to take him to Jesus. You've heard the testimony of other people that have been set free and you want to take him to Jesus. And you, you say that, but you know that there's a part of you that doubts. And oh, doubts can come from all different forms. We can The devil can use Bible verses to get you to doubt God. Trust me. You can say, I know the Bible says this, but, and I know we need to balance Scripture with Scripture, but be careful that it always balances you in faith toward God, never in unbelief. The balance of Scripture properly will never lead you to unbelief. Get that. The balance of Scripture always leads you to faith in God. But Satan will use Scriptures out of balance and, and tip you in the position of unbelief. Don't let that happen. Draw near to God and say, Oh God, help me. Help me believe. I'm coming to you. I'm bringing this loved one before you. I'm laying them at your feet. And I'm believing you to do a miracle. Help them and help my faith. Next point is this. Jesus set this boy free. Jesus set this boy free. He rebuked that foul spirit. I love that word. It says that foul spirit, just filthy spirit. Get out of him. And the spirit throws him down. And he begins to convulse there on the ground and leaves. Now let me give a little rabbit trail side note. There are many things that are being claimed as the Spirit of God upon a person, which makes them look like what I see in the Bible as those who are possessed of devils. Now we must be very careful to not attribute that which is of the Spirit to demonic activity. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus warned us of that. But that doesn't mean we bury our head in the sand and anyone who claims this is the Spirit of God that we just wholeheartedly say, well, okay, I guess it's the Spirit of God. They say it's the Spirit of God. For many false spirits have gone out into the world. False, fake, deceptive. And Satan doesn't come with horns and a pitchfork. He comes as an angel of light. And when I read the Bible, I see that when the Holy Spirit comes upon a person, one of the fruits of it is self-control. And one of the fruits of a demonic spirit taking a possession of a person is they're out of control. When someone is flopping around on the ground like a fish, it's pretty good sign that's not the Holy Spirit. That's an evil spirit. Now I won't... I will admit, I do believe there are times in which someone can call under the conviction of the Holy Spirit where they're so fearful that they begin to quake. You ever heard of Quakers? <laughs> That's where that word comes from. But then I don't know what happened. I don't know if the Quakers originally it was out of fear of God as they began to tremble and then it got into something else. I don't know, Brother Bill. I don't know where the Quakers are now. But... There have been testimonies of revival where the Holy Spirit comes down in such power that people tremble. And in one sense, out of fear, they, they can't control their hands. 
They can't because they're terrified of a holy God. That I will attribute to the Holy Spirit. But some of the things I've seen in the charismatic movement that are being attributed to the Holy Spirit look like this boy. As this foul spirit throws him to the ground and he begins to convulse out of control. Be careful. But this spirit that had power over this boy, this spirit that was more powerful than this father, was not more powerful than Jesus. There is no principality or power or ruler of darkness which even compares to him. With one word, he made them. With one word, he will cast them into the lake of fire. Or have a, an angel cast them in. He didn't even have to do it himself. And with one word, he can just say, get out. And don't ever come back. Jesus has the power. I know I'm going long, but hey, that's why we're here. I knew someone who was very orthodox. Orthodoxy is good. All right. Amen. Oh, this person was orthodox and in doctrine and could had all the theology down. But then in their family, they began to deal with demonic activity. And let me tell you something. If you have theology but you don't have theos, when devils show up, you are powerless. You can have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. And as I heard testimony of what was going on in this family, and I was thinking of this man, I thought, oh, oh he has all the Bible answers, and he has such pride in his biblical orthodoxy but I bet you he's realizing how powerless he is right now as Satan has come into his home. And I mean in real possession. I don't care about how much Bible knowledge you know. When Satan shows up, all that matters is that you know God. Right. But this father gets his son to God. And he in humility asks for help. And with the little faith he has, he cries out. And God helps him and sets his son free in a moment. John 8, 36. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. He has the power. One of the things I think it's so important when we're reading through the Gospels and we see Jesus' power to feed the thousands and heal the sick and to cast out devils, that we realize why the Holy Spirit has put those down. Yes, so that we know that He can help us. But I believe the primary purpose the Holy Spirit put these in the Scriptures is so that you and I will know that Jesus is God. That's why. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then John goes on to show you that glory. And he gets to the end of his gospel account and he said, now I've told you all this. But listen, if I wrote down everything he did, the, the books of all the world couldn't contain the things that he did. This man, Jesus, is not just a good man, a good teacher, a good prophet. He is God. And his power shows us that he is God. And Jesus can set anyone free. Now my last point this morning. Genuine fasting and prayer is a way of humbling yourself before God and a, quote, fertilizer that helps your faith to grow. 
If you have an NIV Bible this morning and you read the text, there's something missing. Danae told me about this. She was on a mission trip in Africa. They were dealing with some demonic activity and her and one of the girls she was with, they, they got back and they said, oh, how do we deal with this? Let's go to the Bible. So they went to the Bible and they both looked on their own and then they came together and they said, well, what'd you find? What'd God show you? And Danae said, well, I found in Mark chapter 9 where Jesus said, this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. And her friend who was on that mission trip opened her NIV, went to Mark chapter 9, went and looked at it and said, what are you talking about? Guess what? It's not there in her Bible. This kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. Now, this was the disciples afterward looking at Jesus saying, Jesus, what happened? Now, just go back and read a little bit before this. He had sent them out with power over sicknesses and over demons. And they had gone out and they cast out devils and healed people. And they came back so excited. And they said, even the devils are subject unto us in your name. Remember how excited they were about the power they had over the devils? But now they get to this one. And they are powerless. What happened, Jesus? We had the power then. We don't now. Something that was true then wasn't true now. I wonder if one way you remember saw Samson. Oh, he had the power of God. And yet he began to compromise and compromise. And eventually his hair is cut. But he says, I will go out as I did before. And he had not, did not know that the Spirit of God had departed from him. And he had no power at that point against the Philistines. I'll go out as I did before. Listen. Listen. You may have had power over devils five years ago. But your power only comes from God. And as you're rightly connected to God. We sang about it this morning. Everlasting God. Who doesn't grow weary. He doesn't get faint. And those that wait upon him don't grow weary and don't get faint either. Their strength is what? Renewed. I love the word renewed because it means it's just always new. How can you always be new? I mean, you're new and then you're old. But he says, no. If you're waiting on God, you're always new. You're just renewed with strength and power. But like my cell phone, I don't plug it in, and it becomes powerless. Talking to somebody on the phone, and I hear, doo -doo -doo. Oh. or whatever noise it makes now, it's dead. There's nothing wrong with the phone. I didn't plug it in. It didn't have any power. We must wait upon the Lord to renew our strength. Jesus tells the disciples the issue here. You see, fasting and prayer is a way of humbling ourselves before God, but it's a way of drawing near to God and just having him mysterious. Listen, fasting is a mysterious thing where God can just supernaturally give us strength and power that, that can't be explained by man. Fasting makes zero logical sense. How can me, not eating or drinking, Make me stronger. It makes you weak. 
in the flesh, but it makes you strong in the spirit and your faith will grow. It's like that plant when you put fertilizer on it and it just helps that thing grow. Fasting and prayer can make your faith grow. Fasting and prayer shows my utter dependence upon God. Fasting and prayer will increase my confidence and my faith in God. And maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe you have a loved one in bondage to sin and Satan. And you've brought him to Jesus and you, you're asking for God to work and you ask him to help increase your faith. You know, you believe some, but give me more faith. Maybe the answer is you need to begin to fast and pray. Fast and pray. Ask God for help. Now I do see here that it was the disciples that Jesus said this to, not the Father. But it does seem like he looked at all of them when he said, Oh, faithless generation. The issue was a lack of faith both in the Father and in the disciples who stood there powerless. I remember hearing the testimony of Brother Bill McLeod. They experienced revival up in Saskatoon, Canada. And with the revival that broke out in their community, so did demonic activity. He started having people being brought to him that were demon-possessed, and he said, we would pray for them. The demon wouldn't leave. So he said, we'd, we'd go in a room and we'd just fast and pray until finally we had a breakthrough. Days at a time before finally they'd have a breakthrough. And I thought, wow, you know what? That's what Jesus said. Say that's that's kind of sounds desperate. Well, desperate situations cause for de desperate actions. Maybe you need to get desperate before God on behalf of that loved one that's in bondage. What about you? Will you be like this, Father? I pray you would. You feel powerless against the power of Satan in the life of your loved one. Take it to Jesus. Seek Jesus on their behalf. And go through with God till you get through with God. And look to him to do a miracle. He is a miracle working God. He still is. He still and give power over demons and devils.